and we're taking a walk now over to the Louvre Museum going through Gallery Vivienne and we'll be taking sort of a back route to the Louvre through the Palais Royal. This is a beautiful green oasis in the middle of the city. You'd never even know it's there from the outside, but inside it's a uh, public gardens with fountains and benches and usually there's some kind of art exhibit, beautiful trees and flowers. It's a great spot to pay a visit inside the Palais Royal. They have this somewhat odd permanent installation of cement pipes. And the Louvre Museum is just across the street. So we enter and right away our guide is telling us some about the history of the building which started out as a royal palace. All the kings of our country lived there and before the Louvre looked like this chateau. And what you're going to see is original of the 14th century. In front of you here used to be the foundation, the basement, if you want, of the chateau of the Louvre, 14th century. And imagine that the part where you're walking now used to be the part of the moats. We used to have water all around this chateau and draw bridges. We're going to approach this enormous animal that we call the Sphinx of Egypt. It used to be usually at the entrance of an Egyptian temple to protect the temple. And usually a Sphinx is, has a body of an animal and the head of the pharaoh. And you see the body of the lion. He, it is a lion. And you see the face. Latinus de Milo. Yes, sir. And why do we call this uh, statue like this? What is Milo? Is the name of the island, and we say Milos. This is the name of the island where was discovered this statue. Is it stone or is it marble? What do you think of the material? Marble, exactly. And why is it so famous? Well, we are in the 6th century BC. And uh, this is the first time that an artist represents movement. You know, before this period, all the statues were very rigid. Whereas here, you see there is one leg in front of the other one. The head is looking on the, on the left side. You have a movement of the breast. And Venus is the goddess of beauty, love, what else? Fertility, uh, god of, goddess of the woman, of course. Do you have any idea of what is the subject of this uh, statue? Yes, you're right. Uh, we say. Uh, Often here in France, uh, Diana, you know, the goddess of the hunt. And we are in a room where you have many statues again here. But it's interesting for you because this is a former room used by the kings of France when they stayed here. And it was the former dancing room. And especially this room was created by a very important queen who stayed here. You may have heard of her because you came from Italy, uh, the Queen Catherine of Medici. You remember Florence, the great uh, Florence woman Medici. Yeah, it really helps to have a local guide to explain the things that you're looking at and there are so many things to see here in the Louvre. It also helps to sit down once in a while and rest. We do try and sit down about once an hour anytime we're out on our walking tours. Rest up for five or ten minutes. Even the ceilings are deluxe treasure houses in the Louvre which had been a royal palace. You're watching an art history tour of Europe with some students from Punahou School. We spent a couple of days in the Louvre and we're showing you 
Some extensive highlights of that visit. Here's the three graces up on the ceiling. But the three most important and popular pieces are the Venus de Milo, the Mona Lisa, and the Wing Victory. This is the Wings Victory. We say the victory of Samothrace. So this statue was made to symbolize the battle of Samothrace. A masterpiece of the Louvre, same period like the Venus, 6th century BC. You can compare the style with the Venus, don't you think? I mean, the movement of the dress, the movement of the body, especially one leg in front of the other one. Of course, the difference is here that you have two wings added to the body and no head. Well, she used to have a head, obviously, but along the time it disappeared. But nevertheless, it is very well preserved. So you have a lovely view here. Okay, so I propose you to see some French paintings. We're going to uh, focus our attention on a very important uh, French painter of the 19th century, David, the official painter of Napoleon I. When you look this painting, do you see the coronation of Napoleon I? No. What do you see? The coronation of his wife. Exactly. And what is the name of his wife? Josephine was the first wife of Napoleon. This coronation in the Cathedral Notre Dame that you visited of Paris. Of course, Napoleon dressed like a Roman Emperor Josephine in front of him. Look at the beautiful coat she has. This coat was especially made for her with 12 kilos of pure ermine. The ermine is the animal that we use in the past for the coats of the kings and queens of France. Don't you think that we can touch? It's very attractive. We would like to touch the coat the ermine coat. Of a main painting of David, the oath of the Horace. So what did you learn about this painting? What do you know about this painting? They're swearing to fight for Rome. Exactly. Yes? yes. With the hands. Yes. With the hands, three of them meeting together. And you see, they are not touching the, the, the sword. They approach the sword. So you're totally right. And you see also the dresses. Those are their sisters or their wives. Exactly. And they're all sad. Exactly. Another lovely painting. This one. Do you know? Do you remember the name? Grand Odelais. The? The Grand Odelais. Exactly. The Odelais or the Grand Odelais. L'Odalisque. And do you remember the painter? Ingres, yes, we say ingress or Ingres, representing as a goddess. Otherwise, we will never accept such a painting in the 19th century. You are not allowed for a painter in that time to choose any woman and to represent somebody with no clothes, a nude body of any common woman. It's very shocking. Even the ceilings in the Louvre Museum are works of art in themselves. And the next room has several major paintings, including Liberty Leading the People. The most important painting of France, of the Louvre and of our history. So what is the subject of this painting? As you say, the Liberty. Who is the Liberty here? A woman, yes. When you look at her, she is with a dress, well, the breast outside. She has always 
the French flag in her hand and she's leading the people and you see they are behind her and de la croix was always close to the poor people was always ready to help and something amazing about this painting in order to show that he really participated in this revolution he painted himself in the painting and do you see him where is de la croix just in front with the suit and his hat he was of the nobility he was coming from a rich family but nevertheless he helped them to do the revolution do you see there is a young boy with them on the right he has a gun also do you see him a young boy of six seven years old who is afraid of nothing and who is ready to follow the republic to follow the liberty and even to be killed himself because he has a gun in his hand when you turn and you observe this painting called the death of Sardanapal it's another painting of Delacroix showing you this man on his bed a sort of dictator Mr. Sardanapal and he's going to kill all the village you see the violence of the people especially through this man here you see the passion expressed by the painter and something strange about de la croix and we don't know why he decided to add here a horse it's strange because we are in a room in a private room mr de la croix used to live for a few years in algeria and that's the reason why you have this painting here showing you a harem you know what a harem is in the arabic countries it is a place reserved for women so he entered inside a harem and he painted the atmosphere of that woman's and you see they're smoking probably a sort of drug we don't know probably but it's amazing to see that a man like de la croix could go inside a harem of women in the 19th century you recognize napoleon the first you know he was not a tall man and he loved to have always this sort of hat and you can recognize her of course Joan of Arc and I would like to tell you that this painting is also a painting of ingress and she really helped the king to liberate France from the English soldiers as you can see here it's always very terribly crowdy don't worry of course we're not going to explain all the paintings of this uh, long gallery called the Grande Galerie, the Great Gallery, because this is where you have the Italian Renaissance paintings. This is the first time that you are in front of Mona Lisa. You expect probably something bigger. What do you know about Mona Lisa? Why is it so famous? Smile. 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 Yes. What else? Eyes. Yes. Who is she or who is he? So this is really the, the big question, the big mystery. And then we say Mona Lisa because a Mona Lisa in Italian, as you may know, is this sort of woman looking like a virgin, looking like somebody very pure. When we are close to her, we have this special curious sensation as you say of the movement of the mouth and the eyes when we observe the painting with the laser system we can see some uh, uh, professors of, of art say that we can see sometimes the portrait of Leonardo da Vinci himself we have different interpretations trying to see to see who is this person 
I mean, we don't know who is this person. We have a lot of questions about this painting, and maybe this is the reason why this maintain a certain uh, mystery. Everybody has heard of the Mona Lisa in the world. There are a couple of large enclosed courtyards in the Louvre that are sculpture gardens. And it's amazing to think that just five, ten years ago, these courtyards were open air parking lots for the bureaucrats of the finance ministry that used to be in this wing of the building. They moved out and the museum nearly doubled in size and gained its spectacular modern glass pyramid, which is the new entryway to the museum. It's uh, the newest item at the museum. There's some very old items at the museum, of course. That was some writing. This is the Mesopotamian galleries from the ancient civilizations in what is today Iraq. Some of the earliest forms of writing were that Linear A and Linear B dates way back to several thousand years BC. And we got to take some photos with these broken statues, of course. Here's Mansart, who designed a lot of the architecture of Paris, famous for his Mansart roof. There's a huge gallery inside that devoted to large paintings by Rubens, glorifying Marie de Medici. She was the Italian princess who was of the noble Medici family, married to French king and moved to Paris and was very homesick. So she had Rubens glorify her in all of her regal beauties. And this series of paintings hung in her private palace, which is in the Luxembourg gardens. And they're all moved here to the Louvre as part of the expansion and modernization the architect was I.M. Pei, and he actually designed that room as well as the major expansions and the glass pyramids. The new pyramid also relates to the ancient Egyptian collections of the museum, which are some of the finest in the world. Here's a scribe, a very important character in ancient Egypt, and some small bronze statues of cats, mother cats, how tender, with their nursing kittens. Cats were among many animals considered to represent gods to the ancient Egyptians. They were polytheistic. They had many gods. They had many sphinxes, many beautiful statues, which fortunately have survived. A lot of these collections were excavated in the 19th century by French archaeologists. Starting with Napoleon and his invasion of Egypt, he brought a lot of scientists with him. And they began excavations that have continued right up until the present day. They have an excellent collection of sarcophagi. These are the coffins. The mummies would be inside and they go in a stone tomb, something like these large original stone tombs. Of course, all the artifacts here are original. They're the real thing. Many of them have been restored. They have a great collection of Akhenaten artifacts. The radical pharaoh represented in these small statues. Here's Akhenaten himself who became the first monotheistic ruler in history. He abandoned the many old gods of Egypt and started up his own religion worshiping the sun. There's Porus. After Akhenaten, Egyptians quickly went back to worshiping all of their original gods, including Horus, the falcon god. And then we change pace and have a look at the paintings of Rembrandt. Uh, first of all, you have a portrait of the painter. Rembrandt did more self-portraits than any major painter in the history of art. Yeah, this is the one you want to get up close to because it's very different than a lot of his other paintings. This particular painting, for me, starts talking about a lot about what we call painterly use of paint, meaning the, the, the brush stroke starts talking about the form instead of just the color and the tone, but the brush stroke, how he puts the paint down, the texture of the paint gives a sense of the flesh. If you've ever seen a, or any kind of carcass, 
of an animal like that, you can see that that's what the kind of texture looks like when they pull out the skin and everything else. It's also one that uh, Francis, Francis Bacon started, got some influence from and looked at from too. So if you know anything about Francis Bacon, you'll start seeing some of the influence in there. The Punahou students were fortunate to have their art teacher along, Pete Hansen, who contributed much useful information as we went through the galleries, such as this description of some techniques of Vermeer. Diagonal lines within the compositions themselves. Again, diagonal lines are much more active. Diagonals create much more interest and pull your eye. That's why this one is also so powerful. You can see these huge three main areas. Here's one diagonal, here's the main diagonal, and then the third diagonal. You can also see that also in this one a little bit more to mean cross as well. So it's an interesting combination where he starts really pushing the light and using the light as part of the composition. That's why the, the darks are not so dark, is that the light wall is reflecting back onto her face, again creating a second lighting idea coming through that way. Mm -hmm. We also got a look at some large paintings by Van Dyck, including his portrait of Charles I. Look at the architecture here. This staircase is original. And can you please tell me of which period it is? Neoclassicism. So? Uh, 1800s. Voila. So we're using this original staircase now. Well, it's good to get outside and get some fresh air after spending so much time in the Louvre Museum. Actually, we spent a full day in the museum, but it was divided up into two half days. It would be pretty difficult for even the most die-hard art fan to spend an entire day inside the Louvre. It's good to break it up, get outside, do something else.